Hare Krishna. Welcome, welcome, dear devotees. Thank you so much for joining us. So today we are back here again celebrating the wonderful book, The Bond of Love. And we have very special guests with us today. Uh, I want to welcome Her Grace Shama Kishori. Hare Krishna, Shama Kishori. Hare Krishna. Kishori, it's such a pleasure to have you. Shama Kishori Prabhu is a second generation devotee. She has served at the Krishna House as an ashram leader. She's such an enthusiastic speaker, preacher, wonderful kirtanir. It's such an honor to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And it's such a great honor and pleasure to welcome Her Grace Rukmini Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Jai Rukmini Prabhu, please accept our humble obeisances. And my obeisances to you, to all of you. Jai. Thank you so much for joining us and agreeing to be a part of this interview series where we are celebrating this beautiful book, The Bond of Love. It's a very important book. Everyone has to read. <laughs> I just want to, just for my own purification, Rukmini Prabhu is a very well-known devotee. She's often very famously known as Urban Devi. <laughs> um, she was initiated in 1968 by Srila Prabhupada in Montreal. That's, you know, five decades of service. Mm -hmm. It's like a lifetime of service and dedication to Srila Prabhupada. And she served in so many different capacities. She I was reading through your bio and it was so beautiful that you proper actually sent you to learn arts and skills, some particular art of doll making. <laughs> um, it's just amazing how you know disciples were so dedicated at that point of time. They just did whatever was needed. And um, I've also heard of your wonderful cooking, Bundi Laddus, uh, <laughs> and so many different aspects. Not only that, she had a business through which she was supporting so many different, uh, you know, so many different programs. And now she's dedicated herself to preaching and bringing Krishna consciousness in the most palatable way to the Western countries, to the Western audience, uh, to spiritual seekers. We're so honored and grateful to have you here with many people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Krishna. It's really an honor to speak about this wonderful book. Is there some? I thought I'm, not, I'm hearing some scratching. Yes, a little bit, but uh, it should be fine. Okay. Yeah, it's an honor to speak about this wonderful book. It's a very, very important read for all of us. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I'm so excited to be here with you. Um, and, you know, I've always looked to you so much. You contribute so much to my life personally and um, the inspiration you give so many Vaishnavis. So I feel really excited that we get to do this together. So, my honor. and I loved your piece in the book as well, A Bond of Love. Your, your piece in there is really touching. So the first question I'd like to ask you today is, why did you choose to participate in the book? Because all of us who saw and experienced the love and the uh, really powerful purity of Srila Prabhupada, his presence and his, his gifts to all of us, we have a real debt to him that we can never repay. In innumerable lifetimes, we can never repay the debt to him. So uh, we have to, it's our, it's our honor to share the stories. Um, you know, people talk about, Srila Prabhupada talked about the person Bhagavad and the book Bhagavad, and both are really essential. Um, even in the book Bhagavad, the whole book Bhagavad is all stories about person Bhagavads exchanging with each other. So these stories are so, 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 so important to understand Srila Prabhupada's personal dealings. 
with his daughters, with his his Vaishnavi, his beloved Vaishnavi daughters. So it's my honor. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's so wonderful that um, this whole book was compiled and put together like that. And huh. um, you must have read other Vaishnavi stories in the book. And yes. I'm curious to know what you've learned from the other stories that you read. Yeah, so I wanted to say, first of all, that quite frankly, I didn't think the book was going to be as, as wonderful and engaging as it is, because I thought, well, you know, most ladies only saw Prabhupada maybe across a crowded room or maybe scurrying out of his room after cleaning his room or receiving a cookie from him or something like that. So I didn't think it was going to be as, as powerful and impactful as it is. But it's, it's really a tremendous read. And some of those stories of those, just those moments when Srila Prabhupada um, glanced at someone and their whole life was changed. In particular, I wanted to, maybe I could just share a little bit from this beautiful entry by Vegavati. She's talking about how she was dancing in a kirtan in the Hanalulu temple. And she's looking at Srila Prabhupada, she's singing, she's dancing, and then his glance fell on her. And then she says, it penetrated my soul in a way that I had never experienced before. He was seeing me as a soul. His glance made me for the first time clearly aware of myself as a soul. And then she says, but she's, she's embarrassed because she feels like he's seeing all of, her, all of her faults, her hypocrisy, her prejudices. And she was embarrassed and humiliated and she looked away kind of in shame, she says. But then the kirtan was going on, the holy name was there. And after some time, Prabhupada's magnetism, she says, made her look at him again. And his glance was again right there. And she said, this time I could understand two things. One, that I have this pettiness, but in spite of it, Prabhupada loves me. Still, I was embarrassed and looked away and the kirtan kept going on. Then I looked a third time and this time, I understood that Prabhupada sees and loves me as a pure soul. He conveyed to me that conditioning will fall off in time because it's temporary. You don't have to relate to that aspect. He brought me to a higher level, a level that's my real home, and I know I will get there by becoming purified by following his instructions. Practically daily, I still see in myself examples of ridiculous, stupid jealousies, envy, selfish thoughts, but so in other words, she never actually had a conversation with Srila Prabhupada, but her whole life was, was changed and, um, and uh, she was spiritually validated and accepted by that glance. It's such a beautiful exchange. And there's so many like that. Um, you know, I also wanted to say that, you know, most of the other gurus who were traveling and teaching at that time you know, other gurus from other traditions, most of them, you see photographs of them, and they're all surrounded by women. And many of them, um, it was later found that they were sexually exploiting those women disciples. So we might say, well, why was Sri the Prabhupada so strict like that? But he was so compassionate, and yet he was very strict so that we could understand um, that there was no exploitation and his purity, his power, and his purity was always there along with his compassion. So that's just an important point, I think. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it's um, so special that people were devotees, disciples felt Prabhupada's love just from a, a look, or they felt so much through that message that wasn't even necessarily words involved. And it was so completely transformative. Their, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So completely incredible. transformative. Like so many people, again and again, when you read these beautiful entries, you read someone say that, I wasn't really sure. I kind of like the devotees, but I didn't really know. And then Prabhupada's glance, and they were able to, she was able to dedicate her life to Srila Prabhupada's service from that one glance. It's really mm -hmm. astounding. Yeah, yeah, really amazing. And it's, for us in the second and third generations, it's very touching to also see how a, sim a single moment like that can um, encourage a person's whole life of sharing to others. You know, like they're exactly to see that that you have all of you have so much love for Prabhupada, regardless of how much physical time you spent with him. 
Certainly. Yeah, you know, your your point is is reminding me of another beautiful entry in this book, the entry by Manju. Um, actually, it was the entry by Vrindavaneshwari, another one of my god sisters. She was on a bus going up, or in a van or something, going up to see the Rathayatra, and she said one lady who was not initiated yet, her name was Mary. She later became Manjuwali, the beautiful Manjuwali. And Manjuwali was so kind to her and so friendly to her, even though she herself was, was new herself, she also wasn't initiated, that that also changed the trajectory of her life. So, you know, each one of us has that choice. We have that capacity to, to change someone's life just by caring and extending the compassion that we've received to someone else. So thank you for reminding me of that beautiful story. That's so beautiful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And, and we can feel Prabhupada's love through all of you. Like you become, uh, you reflect that in your dealings, all of your, you know, you and your generation. And so we feel close to Prabhupada through all of you. Um, Thank you so, so much. So maybe reflecting a little bit on your experiences with Srila Prabhupada, what are some of the things that uh, you feel grateful to Srila Prabhupada for? You know, I would say that Srila Prabhupada gave us what seekers have sought throughout the centuries. Um, what he, you know, we were just this ragtag band of practically children, totally unqualified. Most of us were um, hippies or some sort of rebels. And Prabhupada, it was like he gave us the holy grail that seekers have been seeking for centuries. Um, he showed us the face of God. He, he, um, he taught us who to love and how to love and who is the object of love and, and how to cultivate and receive that love. And, you know, I was reminded when I looked at this question that we, you and I were discussing, I was thinking of the purport, Srila Prabhupada's purport, the verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, second chapter, verse number six, where really that verse gives the definition of love. Savai pun sam paro dharma yato bhakti radhoksaje ahoitikiya pritiyata yayatma suprasiddhati. That actually once Radhana Swami said that verse changed the whole trajectory of his life, where where love was defined, how to love, you know? So I was thinking of that purport, Srila Prabhupada says in the purport that this relation of servant and the served is the most congenial form of intimacy. And that we can realize as devotional service progresses. So this is, these are Prabhupada's gifts, you know? He revealed our own eternal identity beyond and beneath the lifetimes of layers of coverings and, and masks. And he showed us the goal of life and how to act each day to attain the goal of life, how to see ourselves and see others as spiritual beings, uh, you know, humans, animals, trees, the earth. Who teaches this? Where do you find this? You don't find this in other places. Um, you know, the beautiful philosophy of Achintya Beda Beda Tattva that we are, um, the same as God, but we are infinitesimal. We have the same, that's such a sacred teaching, so rare. You know, he gave us treasures, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, nectar of devotion, nectar of instruction. I mean, in, in lifetimes, we couldn't even digest and understand all of these books. And then he connected us to this, what he calls, um, in one place he said, the, uh, most voluminous, consistent, and exacting line of disciplic succession. So he gave us a simple lifestyle based on Shastra, but, but, but with this immensely profound and evolved spiritual philosophy. And then, you know, I think in summary, to think of my answer to that question, what did he give us? He gave us what all human beings want more than anything, to, to love, to know how to love and to be loved for who we really are underneath all of those masks and coverings and beyond, beyond all those games. This, this is what he gave us. So, you know, there are no greater gifts that, that anyone could aspire for. You know? mm, wow, so many wonderful points. Um, I was thinking how we all really want, that's the root of our 
desires is to feel loved. And Prabhupada was really loving the essence of his disciples, not, like you said, not the masks. And that's so powerful because in this world, we often feel like love is um, based on how we're presenting or um, right, right. A, a facade almost. So he right. was really if someone this. really knew me, this, yeah. if, if he or she really knew me, they wouldn't really like me because I'm so full of faults. But yet, you know, as we heard in that entry by Vagavati and so many other entries reflect that that he saw me as I really was and loved me anyway. So, mm. so much reflecting the quality of Krishna, that Krishna knows us better than we know ourselves and loves us anyway. Mm. You know, these are, these are the qualities of God that are reflected in his dear most pure devotees. So. Yeah, wow, so wonderful. And it increases our faith in Krishna's love when we experience yeah. that. Yeah, when you think about Putana, I mean, he accepted, this is what all the great devotees think of, you know, I'm so full of fault, but still he accepted Putana, who had such devious motives. Well, certainly he'll accept me too, even though I'm, I'm so riddled with faults and, and, you know, ill motives. So it's very hope-giving and faith-giving, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe in this connection, you could share a little bit about... Um, your personal interaction with Prabhupada, what that was like, if you if you felt any of those things in that experience. Yeah, so many stories, so many many stories, um, just so encouraging and and so um, yeah, there's so many many stories I could share. Um, I just thought of one that I wasn't going to share, but it's really kind of sweet that. Once after a Pandal in Delhi, a group of devotees, we were in Prabhupada's room in this, a previous Delhi temple, which was a small house. And, um, and Prabhupada was kind of chastising the temple president because he'd gotten a location for this Pandal that was way, way far away from the center of town and Prabhupada was not pleased. And so he, he was commenting that, uh, I won't say the name of the temple president, but he was saying, he has gotten us a location that people will have to cross the seven oceans and seven seas to find us. And then somehow he was reminded of the first verse of Sikshastakam, Bhava Maha Devagni Nivakanam, the, you know, the, the, how we're suffering in this ocean of material, material life. And he began quoting from the Sikshastakam. And um, I was just sitting in the corner. I was, I was very young at the time, I think maybe maybe at that time I was about 20. And I was sitting in the back corner and there were um, sannyasis and Sanskrit scholars sitting up by Prabhupada's desk in the front. And he started quoting from Sikh Shastakam. And he was just saying a few of the words and acting like he didn't know the next words, like Nayanam Galada. What is that Nayanam Galada? And no one was saying anything. And I was sitting in the back corner. And so really quietly, I said, Nayanam Galada Shudaraya. And Prabhupada, it was almost like he was using me to just tease them. It was so funny. And so he, he points to me, he says, yes, what is that? And he had, me, he had me chant the verse. And then he says to his Sanskrit scholars and sannyasis who are up in the front, he said, you see, this little girl, she knows, you do not know. It was so funny. You know, and then and then he did it again, you know, with another verse of Sikh Shastakam, Yugaitam, Yugaitam. And then I said, I said the verse, Yugaitam Nimishena Chaksusa. And you know, the others didn't seem to know. <laughs> Maybe they knew many, many verses, but not not those, you know. So then what happened was I became quite big headed that, oh, I know the verse and they don't know the verse. So then of course Prabhupada had to chastise me. Right. And so then he started talking about the Ugra Karma civilization, how there are so many hideous uh, endeavors and hideous um, constructions and manufacturing. And, and he said, just like there are these huge crucibles, crucibles, he said. And so I was sitting in my corner. I said, mm. I just did that. I just said, 
Mm. And Prabhupada looked at me like, like fire eyes, right? And he said, oh, you know what is crucible? And I said, and I should have stopped there because I really didn't know what a crucible was, but I was so puffed up that I thought I would venture a definition. So I said, well, Srila Prabhupada, isn't the crucible one of those um, rooms where a monk meditates? I, I was thinking cubicle, right? And so Prabhupada just tossed his head. He had this beautiful gesture where he would toss his head in total disgust. He tossed his head and he said, does anyone know what is crucible? And so then Brahmananda Swami said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, a crucible is one of those gigantic forms in which they melt molten steel for building gigantic skyscraper buildings. And Prabhupada just looked at me and he smiled and he said, yes, that is crucible. <laughs> so we know he was so expert at uplifting us, encouraging us, but then bringing us down as soon as um, we became covered with false pride. So that's mm. a story I wasn't even going to share that one, but you inspired me. Yeah, thank you for sharing that one. Um, I like how in one interaction, both of those things can happen. And I've yeah. heard other disciples of Prabhupada mention that too, within within one interaction that they <laughs> they can feel yeah. both. Yeah. There's Amazing. another one that, that I, I like to mention, um, that sometimes if you listen to Prabhupada's room conversations, you'll hear him quote a Bengali aphorism where he says, um, it's about Hanuman, about how Hanuman was a big monkey and he jumped to Ceylon. And so, but, but the, the aphorism says, big, big monkey, big, big belly. But if you try to jump to Ceylon like Hanuman did, you can't do it. You're melancholy. So it's big, big monkey, big, big belly, Ceylon jumping, melancholy. So he sometimes just, you'll hear him under his breath, breath go, big monkey, big belly. When he's trying to put down someone who's become proud. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and I know that you also mentioned when we were speaking that he had a good sense of humor as well. So, oh yeah, his his humor yeah. was wonderful. You know, he could, you know, um, actually one of our friends, Peter Burwash, who was uh, a, a big, he owned an international um, network of tennis clinics. And he said one devotee, one, he loved Prabhupada. Prabhupada gave him instructions on how to, how to run his business. And he said one devotee once said to him, Krishna consciousness is a very serious thing. And Prabhupada never smiled. And it was so ridiculous because Prabhupada um, was full of humor and he was always showing us how to take ourselves lightly, but he could go into a mood of ecstasy and be overwhelmed with tears in one moment and in the next moment be laughing at the absurdity of the material world. So um, he was like a prism with so many prismatic qualities um, in, that were always being exhibited in different ways, like a like a turning prism, you know? Yes, what a nice imagery, I like that. So we had a question. Um, do you believe it's important for the next generation of devotees to develop a personal relationship with Srila Prabhupada and, and how can we do that? Like why and how could we as second and third generations do that? I think this is probably the most important question and the most important point that needs to be made. Um, We've heard that Srila Prabhupada is the Siksha Guru for us all. He is the founder of Charya of ISKCON. But we have to understand that this is not just a boring cliche and that our eyes are just going to glaze over when we hear something like this. Because maybe you never saw him face to face, but you can really meet him in the mercy of his books, in his conversations, in his letters, and in the remembrances like the ones that are being shared in this wonderful book, The Bond of Love. You can meet him in those places and, um, and get your deepest questions answered. I, I think it was also Vega Vati who said in this book that she reads Srimad Bhagavatam first thing when she wakes up in the morning and she finds that her questions are always answered there. So this is the mystery of the disciplic succession that Srila Prabhupada is, is answering our questions even through his books, through his conversations, through his wonderful letters. And there's a beautiful story that I want to share. Um, 
Yeah, I, I wanted to share, this is my mom, most, most favorite story of Srila Prabhupada, and I think it speaks to the second, the next generations, plural, and the future. So Srila Prabhupada said to uh, this wonderful devotee, Adi Purusha in New York, who is still to this day distributing prasadam on the streets of the Lower East Side. He once asked Prabhupada, he said, Srila Prabhupada, he was a brand new devotee, in New Vrindavan, and he asked Srila he was Prabhupada's night guard in his house, and he was guarding in the garage because it was raining outside. Prabhupada came in behind him, and he, he was surprised. He offered obeisances, and then he said, Srila Prabhupada, is there any service I can do for you? And Srila Prabhupada said the most astounding thing that I really want all of you, if you forget everything else that I shared today, please remember this. Srila Prabhupada said, yes, you can go where I will not go. And he was bewildered, but Srila Prabhupada, you're going everywhere. You're just in Japan and San Francisco and Dallas and Chicago and New York, and now you're in New Vrindavan, you're on your way to London and Paris and you know Germany. Where is it that you won't go, Srila Prabhupada? You go everywhere. And Prabhupada said this astounding thing. He said, to the future, to the future. And he said, and by the way you treat the people there, they will know how much Krishna loves them. So I think this is a very, very important mandate really for all of us, for all of, all of the people going into the future. That the way you treat that newest person who walks into the temple, the way you treat anyone, the way you treat the most simple person that you meet on the street, the way you treat your temple president, your guru, your anyone, your parents will show them how much Krishna loves them and will open up a whole world for them of Krishna's love by the way you treat them. So we each have that capacity to carry Krishna with us, to carry Prabhupada's mercy with us to, um, to people's hearts, you know, um, carry this magnanimous mood. This is the mood of Lord, we're, about, we're approaching Lord Nityananda's appearance day. This is the mood of Lord Nityananda. This is the mood of Prahlad Maharaj that was always exemplar, exemplified by Srila Prabhupada. Um, and especially, I think, in this time, you know, we're all hyper connected on the internet. Everyone is attached at the hip to their mobile phone, right? But yet we're the most, more disconnected than we've ever been, more isolated. It's like, what's that saying? The loneliness of the crowd. So even though we're super connected, hyper connected, we are so lonely. So this is an opportunity to really give Prabhupada's mercy and Krishna's own association by, by sharing the gifts that Srila Prabhupada gave us. Very encouraging that we can, no matter how many generations, very close to Srila Prabhupada through those methods that you mentioned, like finding personal meaning in the purports for our lives and also uh, hearing stories from your generation, like the books that are left, the legacy that will always be there for us. I find for myself that I feel the closest to Prabhupada when I'm seeing the, when I'm seeing his videos or hearing the stories from his disciples. Yeah. And, and it personalizes him even more yeah. so than just reading his books. They have to kind of both be there. At least that's so what I've The wonderful um, following Srila Prabhupada series by Yadabhar and Vishaka, where yeah. you hear the devotees um, kind of illuminating what was going on at that time. So you hear Prabhupada's lecture or you see his walk, but then a devotee will say, oh, well, what was going on at that time was this, that, and the other thing. And you get the whole context. It's very, very powerful and, and beautiful. Um, yeah, so this is for all of us to share, I think. Um, you know, and it also, one thing comes to mind is that, you know, we might be moping around thinking, oh, I wish I'd been there. I wish I'd met Prabhupada. Where was I? I was just loitering around in some other life. But, you know, when you think of the um, great disciples of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Narottam Das Thakur never saw Lord Chaitanya, but he, Lord Chaitanya appeared to him through his devotion, through his service, through his through his pure devotion, he was having the darshan. And Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda came and danced in his kirtan at, at Ketri. So the most empowered followers of Srila Prabhupada might not be us at all, might be all of you, or maybe someone who hasn't even taken birth yet, who has that 
extraordinary love and faith in, in Prabhupada and Krishna um, that they can um, pay forward in their lives. So I think that's very important also. Mm, yeah, it's beautiful. So I want to ask you um, if there was one thing you could share, like if there was, if you could share just one thing only about Srila Prabhupada, what would you want people to know? I would want people to know that, you know, we think of Prabhupada as being a very traditional person, being steeped in tradition. Um, and he honored tradition as long as it was serving the goal of our developing bhakti. And when tradition became an obstruction to our bhakti, then Srila Prabhupada would reject it. So this is very important. And I think many devotees don't understand this, that all of our endeavors, all the rules and regulations are meant um, to, to give us this goal of, of attaining pure love and service at the lotus feet of Srila Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya and Sri Guru and Goranga. And so many um, of the Bhagavat verses uh, exemplify this, and Srila Prabhupada exemplified this in his own life. He wrote letters, and, and he, um, you know, this verse, Kirata, Hunandra, Pulinda, Purkasa, that names so many different people of different um, parts of the world the Russians and the Africans and the Chinese, so many, the Greeks, the Turks, they're mentioned in this verse. And the verse says, all can attain the mercy of Lord Krishna by the by the mercy of the all powerful, the devotees of the all powerful Vishnu. So this is so important, and we have to be so careful that we don't substitute the less important thing for the most important thing. And the most important thing is that all rules and regulations are meant to help us remember Krishna, never forget Krishna, and they are all servants of this one principle. So we should never take the less important principles to be more important than that essential principle. I think that's really important. Yeah, that's very important. Thank you for sharing. It reminds me a little bit about uh, the incident where you asked Srila Prabhupada, even the women, even the <laughs> Prabhupada, <laughs> do you want yes. to quickly mention that, that incident? Yeah, that was extraordinary because what was happening at that time. So I was really a brand new devotee. I was only 16 at that time. I was, I was, um, it was, it took place upstairs in his room, just behind the 26th Second Avenue little storefront temple. And Srila Prabhupada, here we all were, you know, as I said, just a, you know, ragtag band of practically children. And he, Prabhupada was looking into our eyes, one to the next to the next. And he said, I want each one of you to open a temple somewhere looking, you know, who is going to pick up the seed that he's throwing out, right? And I was so shocked. And I said, even, I was, I just said, even the girls, at that time we called him Swamiji. I said, even the girls, Swamiji? And, and he was laughing and he said, I said, yes, there is no difference between the boys and the girls. When you are sharing Krishna consciousness, there is no difference. And he, then he began to speak about Janava Devi in the most important way and how she was leading the whole disciplic succession as the, as the head and the acharya of the whole disciplic succession at that time. So it was most extraordinary. And, um, and I think these are very, very important instructions. You know, we, we all so often hear that at that time, Iskan was more like a family and there was not so much demarcation between the, the men and the women. So, you know, he called, he called all his women disciples Prabhu and he called even uninitiated girls Prabhu, Kathy Prabhu, this one Prabhu. So there was a sense of honoring and, and offering respect to all without discrimination. And that needs to be carried forward into the future also. It's very, very important. Um, his encouragement for all people and, and not seeing the um, disqualifications, but, but trying to see what were our unique abilities and what were our unique gifts. Once, um, once he, I think he asked Mandakini the same thing. He asked me, he said, he said, um, well, of course, she speaks a few languages, but he asked me, do you know how to type? No, Srila Prabhupada. 
do you know any languages other than English? And I didn't go to very much school at all, but I said, again, my, my pride was cropping up. I said, well, I took Latin in school. And Prabhupada said, oh, you are a Latin scholar? <laughs> and I said, no, Shiva Prabhupada. <laughs> so he was always looking to see how he could engage us, what would be our abilities, how he could engage us in Krishna's service according to our unique talents. And I think probably the best example of that is, well, so many, but, but Vishaka, you know, there were other men who were photographers, but he always gave Vishaka access to, to be there and take the most wonderful pictures of him. There's a beautiful story she tells. I don't know that she told it. I, she didn't tell it in the book. The beautiful story, that famous picture where Prabhupada is, is uh, turned to the devotee. He's doing the arti in the Krishna, at the first arti at the Krishna Balaram temple installation. And he's turned to the devotees and he's got the, can't remember if it's the Chamara or the Peacock fan. And she was trying to get a picture of that and Tripurari Maharaj was right in front of her. And, and she, you know, he was dancing. He was an ex, everyone was in ecstasy and she couldn't get the shot. So she tapped him on the shoulder and she said, Maharaj, if you stand there, you will see Srila Prabhupada. But if you can just step aside for a moment, then the whole world will see Srila Prabhupada. And so he stepped aside and she was able to click that wonderful, famous, wonderful historic picture. So, you know, he gave access according to our desire, according to our abilities in such beautiful ways without discrimination. And I think it's one of the blessings of this book is that we get to see that in, in the voices of all the Vaishnava disciples of Prabhupada, that he didn't discriminate in that way, in any way, yeah. materially. So. Yeah, there's a beautiful story that um, I heard that uh, Sarabhi Maharaj in, in Mumbai, when they were building the Mumbai temple, he told Prabhupada that there was one Muslim worker who, while he was chipping at the stone, while he was, cre you know, building, helping to build the building, he was constantly chanting the name of Allah. Prabhupada's non-sectarian vision, he, he said, I want to see him. And, and so Sarabhi Maharaj said, oh, I'll bring him here, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, no, I don't want to interrupt his work. So Prabhupada himself went there to see this humble man, this stone carver, you know, doing his work and chanting the name of Allah so beautifully. So, you know, we hear stories. Srila Prabhupada, according to, to how they would hear, you know, he would encourage a, a race car driver or a scholar or a villager or a politician or a news reporter or even a little child in the most unique and wonderful ways. So um, these are precious memories and, and examples for all of us that we should really try to see the individual and honor the individual wherever and however we meet them in our lives and try to pay forward that mood of Srila Prabhupada in an authentic way. Mm. That's so wonderful. Um, what is your... Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, my internet no. might have flipped for a second. Yeah. What is your favorite quality of Srila Prabhupada? Wow, well, his mercy to everyone without boundaries and seeing and seeking to engage the potential within each of us as unique individuals, his ecstatic love for Krishna that was always about to rise up and overwhelm him and his constant humor at the absurdity of the world, his, his lightness and his depth at the same time his example of how to see and love and remember Krishna in all things and how to give Krishna always everywhere in all moments, um, in all situations, in all interactions. You know? He was, you know, people talk about being present in the moment. Srila Prabhupada was, because of his pure Krishna consciousness, he was always seeing Krishna, always hearing Krishna, feeling Krishna by his side at every moment. So therefore he could always give the most um, perfect and compassionate and, and sometimes cutting reply to anyone who, who was with him, you know? 
most wonderful ways. You know, I, I think of the re story of the reporter in London. He, he was a bit arrogant, right? So he's saying, what have you come to t here to teach us? You know, we are, we are the British Empire. What have you, you know, you've come from a poverty stricken India. What have you come to teach us? And Prabhupada just shot back, I have come to teach what you have forgotten. And that is God. So, you know, this is, this is the gift that pure Krishna consciousness will give us as well, that we can be so present in the moment and so conscious of the individuality of the person we're dealing with and, and how, to, how to share Krishna with them in the most appropriate and wonderful ways. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you're you're describing how Prabhupada is such a pers so personable, and so uh, he demonstrates that personalism of Krishna consciousness with his interactions with everybody. So, so encouraging and so, so empathetic, you know, always caring how he could he could bring us just one step closer from wherever we were, whoever we were, just bring us once. And sometimes it was. It was a little strong, and sometimes it was all merciful, always merciful in whatever form it came. You know? um, there's a beautiful story in the book, um, just to share some of the stories in the book that are so, I have so many favorites, right? Well, there's one, well, the whole, the exchanges with Mike Tahili. So maybe, you know, if you, if you please look for the in, entry by my dear God sister, Mike Tahili, that's in this book. May, I don't know if you, many of you have heard this story, but when, when the, um, the police were, had been paid off in Mumbai and they were sent to destroy, to break down the little temporary temple because they were all paid off by this man who was trying to cheat Prabhupada. And so the devotees were all arrested. They were sitting in the police paddy wagon and, and there was one lady, Maita Healy, who was there trying to defend the deities before they were gonna break the deities and break the little hut that the deities were in. She was standing by herself, you know, just trying to protect the deities. And finally they dragged her away by her hair. It's a most amazing story how she risked her life um, for, in Prabhupada's service. And in that entry um, from Maiti Healy also, there's is a very sweet exchange that somehow Prabhupada knew that she liked watermelon. And so he would, Prabhupada would distribute um, cut fruit, pieces of cut fruit at the, after his lecture. And so he would pick up the watermelon. She was there and she was looking at the watermelon and Prabhupada would pick up the watermelon to give to her, but then he would put it back and pick up a piece of apple or orange or something. And she would get this very sad look on her face. And Prabhupada was laughing and he was just teasing her and having this wonderful exchange. And then he, picked up the watermelon and gave it to her. So that's the kind of sweet exchanges you, you see in this book. There's, there's one very, very powerful story that I, I did want to share and, and lift up. Um, this is told by a Vaishnavi who, who passed away recently. Her name was Krishna Kumari. And I, I find this to be one of the most important stories that I read in the book. She was a, a teacher in the Dallas Gurukula, and she had a lot of responsibilities. She was teaching academics, but she was also an ashram teacher, which meant that she was on call all the time. And she says in her entry that she felt like she was just braiding hundreds of little girls braids, and she was just so overstressed and felt overworked and, you know, was trying to do things in a very proper, strict way. She thought that was the way to serve Prabhupada, to be very strict. And she tells this story that once Prabhupada was visiting Dallas and he was lecturing in the temple room. And during his lecture, one of the little girls started to cry and she didn't know what to do. You know, obviously this little girl was troubled in some way. Maybe she was missing her mother, you know, some little, little girl. So she took the little girl out of the temple room and went into one of the classrooms and put this little girl in the corner on, on a mat on the floor and told her, you just stay here and don't move. She just thought that was the way to do it, to be very strict. 
And then she, the teacher, went back into Prabhupada's lecture and sat and listened to the remainder of Prabhupada's lecture. So this is the most amazing thing. After Prabhupada completed his lecture, he got off the Vyasasan. He walked out of the temple room. He walked down the hall. And he walked right into that classroom where that little girl had been placed in such a harsh way. Srila Prabhupada obviously had been feeling the pain and the crying of this little girl. He walked right into that classroom and he was walking up to the little girl. And when she, she saw him coming, and she, she had fallen asleep. And she woke up and she sang, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada came up to her and was stroking her head and speaking to her in such a loving and compassionate way. And this teacher saw this and got such a lesson that this is the way we need to, to teach the children, you know, with love and compassion, not in a harsh way, but really understanding them and, and feeling their, um, who they are and what their needs are. I thought this was a very, very important story. Um, yeah. Srila Prabhupada's love and compassion. I love the story of um, Kosalya, another great one you, uh, entry you have to read. Kosalya, um, very dynamic Vaishnavi who did wonderful service for Prabhupada. She and Srimati um, made, created a whole pandal in Jaipur, two women by themselves without any money coming from any ISKCON members. They raised the money themselves. But this one particular story she shares, I think is so beautiful. She, um, Srila Prabhupada knew that she, she could chant the, all the verses of Sri Ishopanishad. And so in front of a big gathering of people one evening, Prabhupada asked her to chant Sri Ishopanishad. And she stood in front of the whole crowd and chanted one by one all the 18 shlokas of mantras of Ishopanishad. And then Prabhupada called her, come here. And she, she came up to his Vyasasana and she went to offer obeisances. Um, maybe I can read it. It's so beautiful. Oh, yeah, here it is. Let's see. She sang the Holy Shopanishad as Prabhupada watched me beaming. He had so much presence that when he smiled, his face lit a room. When I finished, he said, come here and patted his knee. I started to pay my obeisances and he took my head, put it in his lap and pat, patted my head and his and back. And he said, you did very, very well, very well. So beautiful, huh? And another little bit from her entry, she says, once she was complaining about something to Prabhupada, and he said to her, Kosalya, why are you complaining? One little criticism and you are complaining. Look what I have to tolerate. You are looking for a calm sea and you will not find it here in this material world. You will only find it when you are with Krishna. <laughs> Here's another one I want to share that I think is so important. Nandarani. This entry was actually written by Dayananda Prabhu, the husband of Nandarani. And he wrote it in such a beautiful and humble way. So they were serving in, um, in uh, Tehran with Atreya Rishi Prabhu. And so during the conversation there, Atreya Rishi explained that all the devotees were working at regular jobs so that they could stay in the country and maintain the center there. Prabhupada inquired, and so Nandarani is also working? Atreya said that she was teaching. Prabhupada said, yes, she has got experience. Yes, she's very good. Um, and then Prabhupada says, and remember, Nandarani's husband wrote this entry, which I think is so charming. Prabhupada says, both of them, Nandarani and Dayananda, they are both very intelligent, said Prabhupada. And Nandarani is more intelligent than her husband. He laughed. I know that. Atreya, who was quite fond of Dayananda, said, I find that he is very intelligent, Srila Prabhupada. Uh, ah, Dayananda, yes, Prabhupada says. He is intelligent, said Prabhupada. But Nandarani is still more intelligent. Again, he laughed. I know that. Both of them are intelligent but this girl appears to be more intelligent. And then Prabhupada said, that's all right. <laughs> so many beautiful stories. We could spend the whole time just reading from the book. They're wonderful. <laughs> They're so wonderful. Thank you. Those are God's personal dealings with each, with each devotee.
We have a uh, one question for the audience, so we're going to we're going to show it on the screen here. Krishna Mataji Dandavat Pranam, how to engage this generation of children in body, especially girls, when it's mentioned of times about women in the level in I guess she's saying times in the Shastra it's mentioned that women are at the level of shudras and unintelligent. I accept Shila Prabhupada's word completely because I love him, but how to convince girls about our scriptures? You know, we have to understand things according to time, place, and circumstance. And in this age, we are all less intelligent. We are all unqualified. And Srila Prabhupada showed by his personal example how to lift up each of us according to our abilities. So the fact is, in this age, everyone is a sudra. And the, in fact, high caste brahmanas from other sampradayas or other ancient traditions would reject all of us, every single one of us is unqualified right? We are mlechas and yavanas and, and all of these things. So I want to share with you another story that helps in answer to this question. Listen to this one. This is from Mahaguna. She was from Japan and she was married to an American man. And um, they came, she and her husband came into Prabhupada's room. Prabhupada called them into his room in Los Angeles. And in a jolly mood, Prabhupada said, what do you, because she was Japanese, right? So Prabhupada said, what do your parents think about this? I didn't speak, speak much English, she said. I said, I don't have parents, Prabhupada. He laughed and said, oh, the stork has brought you? The stork <laughs> has brought you here? And then her husband said, her parents passed away. Prabhupada told her husband, you should go back to Japan, take citizenship, and your wife can be temple president there. And she says, I thought Prabhupada was joking. So sometimes people say, Prabhupada never made any women temple presidents. There's so many instances when Prabhupada says things like this. So this is a, just one more amazing treasure jewel that you'll find in this book. So we have to understand, we are all unqualified. There's not a, a one of us who's qualified in this age. Lechas, Yavanas, um, Kalo Sudra Sambhava. And we all have to use whatever abilities, because if we don't use the abilities that Krishna has given us, um, then they will, then they will degrade us, right? So, whatever abilities Krishna has given us are His gifts to us, and what we do with them will be our gifts back to Krishna, right? So, it doesn't serve the world for us to hide our abilities, our talents, our our innermost desires of ways to serve, to hide them in a box, like the example of fire in a box. How does that serve the world? No, we have to encourage our children and all the Vaishnavis and all the devotees, use your abilities for Krishna, otherwise they will degrade you. Those very abilities that you've given to create something wonderful in service to Krishna will, be, will destroy you if you don't, don't use them in Krishna's service. That's really wonderful explanation. I've never heard it quite explained that way before, and it really writes. So thank you for that. Very encouraging. While we wait to see if there's uh, more questions from the audience, I'll ask you another question. Um, how did you, well, let's see. What, what about Srila Prabhupada convinced you um, that you should dedicate your life to him? And even now, after all these years, what keeps you involved? Srila Prabhupada's purity, his conviction, his clear, ever-present vision of Krishna. He was the exemplar of Krishna's pure, loving devotee in all circumstances, of impossible and possible and impossible situations. And, and just the fact that we have a debt to him that can never be repaid. He saved us and he gave us a new life of love and service to Krishna. So um, we have to pay it forward. We can never repay him. And so it's kind of like the little sparrow, just trying to take the little beakfuls of, of water from the ocean and offer it back. So whatever we can gather up in our Anjali, we need to keep offering back. And praying to Prabhupada how to do that because just like that question about how, how can, what do I tell my daughter? 
So praying to Prabhupada for intelligence and strength, how, how can we use our, our abilities? And how can we pay it forward to the future? How can we teach his message? And understand that tradition is subservient to bhakti. Bhakti is the main thing. Bhakti is, is, uh, is the main thing. That's what Prabhupada has given us. And if tradition can serve bhakti, if we can be gracious and humble and, and, um, and, and uh, sattvic in our dealings, then that will serve our bhakti. But bhakti is the main thing. Mm. That's helpful. Very nice, yeah. And in connection to that, maybe this will be our last question for the hour. Um, how has your relationship with Srila Prabhupada deepened over time? And especially in, as you've, um, you know, in that mood of separation from Srila Prabhupada, how has that, what has it been like for you? And how, how have you felt closer? Mm -hmm. That's a really important question. And I think if any one of us had the chance, we would want to be in the personal association of Prabhupada. Um, it said that that personal association, that Vapu presence is sometimes appreciable and sometimes it's not. When I was a brand new devotee, I came to Krishna consciousness in San Francisco and um, I was going with the group that was on their way to London. I was going with them to Montreal to meet Srila Prabhupada. And someone said to me, one of the devotees in the San Francisco temple said, you should really stay here and do service because service is higher than personal association. And so I was a bit bewildered and so, then someone said to me, you can be sure that if he had the money, he would be going to see Srila Prabhupada too. So we all wanted that personal association. But um, as, as time goes on, that association goes deeper into our hearts. And in fact, most devotees were serving in separation and our lifetimes are service in separation. Most devotees, even Srila Prabhupada himself, only saw his Guru Maharaj just a handful of times. So that service and separation is very, very sacred, and it goes deeper as time goes on, as we serve and as we study and as we realize. And it's also said that within meeting, there is the anticipation that, oh, this moment's going to be over and Prabhupada's going to be gone, right? Or, or Krishna, the gopis feel like that. But within separation, there is the anticipation of meeting once again. That, and I think, you know, all of all of Prabhupada's sincere disciples think of this: that, you know, one day at the end of this life, I'll see Prabhupada again and be able to join him in another adventure, wherever he is, in some other universe, on some other planet. So that within separation, there's that anticipation of meeting once again. So it's considered mm. that separation is even more sacred than meeting. But we would never give up that chance to meet once again as well. So. Right. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, that anticipation that one day in the future, something wonderful to look forward to. There's one more question from the audience that we will display. Dear okay. Rupini Prabhu, how can I connect to Prabhupada through his books? He feels distant and strict, and I will never have the experience of being in his presence, even if I watch 70s footage or listen to his disciples like you. How can I feel him closer and feel his humanity? Mm, that's a really beautiful question. Um, I think that's something very beautiful to pray for. You know, the verse that Prabhupada quoted more than any other verse in all his writings, Sarvasya Chaham Hridi Sanivisto, that Krishna is situ situated in each one of our hearts, and from him comes remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. So he he's waiting to hear what is your desire? What do you want? So pray for that. Ask Krishna, who's seated in your heart, let me understand the, the beautiful qualities of Srila Prabhupada. Let me hear deeply when I read his books and remember and understand and recollect. You know, so often we read and it's just flying out of our minds as soon as we finish that one line. But I think it's a really important prayer for all of us. How can I really deeply understand this uh, most congenial, um, mood of servant and serv servant and the served and how can I understand, how can I, you know, at, pray to Prabhupada, pray to Krishna, give me the understanding by which I can come to you and which by which I can understand your own personal qualities and dealings and, and realize your 
wonderfulness. Um, I think that's a beautiful prayer. And I think Krishna will, will gift that to us if he sees that's what we desire. You know, if we just want to stand back and say, oh, you know, I, I know once I was in Russia and someone said to me, oh, I've never heard um, these stories about Prabhupada. I only heard about Prabhupada smashing people all the time. So, you know, Prabhupada, as I said, was like a multifaceted prism. And he had many different uh, qualities and many different ways of dealing. So I think that's a beautiful prayer to go deep within our heart. Please let me understand. Let me understand how to go deeper and how to realize and hear Prabhupada answering my deepest questions as I read his books. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you for that really practical advice for all of us. Um, it's been such an honor to, to spend this hour with you. And I, I know that I speak for whoever is watching, you know, on different platforms. I know that I speak for everybody that it's very, it's been very heartwarming, very touching, and also just, um, practical, we, we have tips on practical application now too. So I feel like I've taken this into, into my uh, heart now and I will try to do those things that you suggested for deepening my relationship with Srila Prabhupada. So thank, so you, thank you so much. much. Just, just thank you so much for being who you are and, and touching so many of our, of our lives. Thank you. Your... Well, all you Vaishnavis, please look at urbandavy.com and um, thank you for the opportunity to just take up in my little Anjali some little drops of Prabhupada's glories and, and share them with all of you. This is a great um, blessing for me as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Prabhu. Such an honor to hear you, Rukmini Prabhu. It was such a wonderful experience. You touched on so many beautiful points, so many beautiful pastimes. My heart just feels overwhelmed with uh, joy and uh, I feel so nourished just hearing these beautiful pastimes and interactions of these wonderful disciples which you look out but I thank need to you get the book everyone get the book because there's so much more <laughs> yes we posted a link to Rukmini Prabhu's uh, wonderful page uh, Urban Devi and we've also posted a link to the Amazon where you can purchase a copy of this book this book is not meant to make profit it was just a heart sharing so please get this book, give it as a gift, whatever you can do to promote. I also want to share that, you know, help us promote this event. We have a profile uh, picture frame that you can add to your profile pictures on Facebook. If you just look up Bond of Love and you can find a profile picture frame from the Vaishnavi Ministry in North America, please add that to your profile picture. Help us support the ministry. and. So many wonderful things Rukmini Prabhu you was sharing, especially about uh, you know women being less intelligent, and it was so beautiful, and you explained it so beautifully. And I I was just recollecting one of uh, the passages from Kaushalya Prabhu's uh, you know part of the book, and she was saying that at that. Point, Point, when I was with Srila Prabhupada, I didn't think of myself as a woman or a man. I didn't even think. I only thought of myself as Srila Prabhupada's servant. Yeah. And it was so powerful. She said, Prabhupada never made me feel a woman or a man. Yeah. Yeah, there's a beautiful story that Malati tells when he, Prabhupada was, is there time? Prabhupada was on a walk with all the men and they were kind of, this is in Calcutta. Prabhupada was completely. The men were complaining that the women are, we shouldn't have them in the temple. There's so much this or that. And meanwhile, the ladies were all dressing the deities, cooking the breakfast, cleaning the temple, cleaning Prabhupada's room. Prabhupada didn't say a, a word on that whole walk. And then when he came back to the temple, the ladies were all waiting for him. And Prabhupada looked at them and then he turned to the men and said, if you associate with these women, you will go back to Godhead. <laughs> How are you all? How, are you How wonderful is that? Thank you so much. It's been such an honor to have both of you here. And uh, we're going to continue with this series. We have so many wonderful disciples uh, that we have lined up for these interviews. So please stay tuned. Uh, check out Urban Devi. Check out the Vaishnavi Ministry North American page and stay in touch. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.